up, church? How are we doing this morning? Welcome to Substance. Welcome to church this weekend. So glad you're here. If we have not met yet, my name is Pastor Drew. I serve here as our downtown Minneapolis campus pastor. Also get to serve on the teaching team. So it's so good to see you. And also want to welcome in those of you at the downtown campus if you're streaming online. Love getting to do church with our whole church family. Amen. It's just so fun to do this together. Really quickly, I do want to welcome you into Memorial Day weekend. Can we take a minute just to recognize the families of our servicemen and women, especially those who have given their life on behalf of our country. Uh, we just pray that God would comfort your family this weekend. Uh, if it's, whether it's 20 years ago or, or two hours ago, we just want to ask that God would comfort and bring peace to your families. Um, thank you for serving our country in that way. Well, we are in part six this week of our series, Church Smart. And the whole thesis of this series is this idea of what if church could actually be different? Like what if church could be healthy and effective and fun, am I right? Or funny sometimes. We love doing church in a fun, funny, life-giving way. So this whole series, we've been talking about this idea of what if church was different? What if as we did church, people got saved and got grown up in the love of God and sent out to do the work of the kingdom in our cities? We just love getting to do church as a family together. So this week, I'm going to go ahead and bring that series to a close with a topic that is really near and dear to my heart, the topic of discipleship. I love discipleship. I worked for eight years on a college campus with young adult men and women, kind of seeing them grow up in the Lord. I just love this idea of discipleship. But I also believe that discipleship is actually a pretty tricky concept because here's what I know for sure as I've kind of navigated discipleship waters over the years is that if we're not careful as we think about discipleship, what we're going to do is we're going to take the thing that we think discipleship is and assign that to the entire church. Because right, many of us have passions, we have skills, we have gifts from the Lord, whether it's Bible teaching or inner healing prayer ministry or service outreach to the homeless and beyond. We all have something in our hearts that God has passioned us to do in, uh, in the church, right, Be on behalf of the kingdom of God. But if we're not careful, we're going to take that thing that we're passionate about and say, this is what discipleship is. Right, this is what discipleship should look like for every Christian and every church under the sun, right? And if we're not careful, we're actually going to assign things to the word discipleship that I think God never meant to assign at all. Now, don't get me wrong, these things are awesome. We should be doing Bible teaching. We should be doing prayer ministry. We should be doing outreach. Those things are great. But I want to show you this weekend is I believe those things actually serve a greater purpose, what God wants to do in discipleship. So as we jump in, uh, basically, biblically, the best idea of a disciple we can have is the idea of a student, one who is teachable, humble, one who follows the teaching of someone or something. And let's, let's be clear, we can't have an honest discussion about discipleship unless we admit that everything in this world is trying to teach us something. Like I don't go into or out of any situation in my life without learning something. You with me on that one? Whether I'm going to the mall, whether I'm going to school, whether I'm going to a conversation with my wife or with my parents, wherever I am at, I'm always learning something. And I've never been more aware of this than when I'm watching TV with my kids. Now, my kids and I, we love to watch sports on TV. I've been watching the NBA playoffs, my two oldest boys especially. We just love sitting down, uh, watching the first or second quarter of the game. They go to bed, and then I get to watch the rest of the game in peace, am I right? Uh, but we just love getting to do that together. Um, I've never been more aware of how much we're being taught than I'm, when I'm watching TV with my kids. Here's what I mean. When my son Judah, he's now eight, um, when he was about three or four years old, we would sit down and watch the NCAA tournament together or a nice basketball game. And um, every single commercial that came on, I was like, I got to cover his eyes. I mean, there is some crazy stuff on those commercials. I think that was around the time when um, CSI was kind of the new hot thing. You guys remember CSI? Crime scene investigation. There was like one in Las Vegas, one in New York, one in Miami, like CSO Idaho. I don't even know where all the CSIs were. A lot of potato-related crime, evidently. <laughs> in Idaho. Um, you get the idea, right? Like there's all these commercials. They would come on. I would find myself as soon as like you could tell the music of a commercial what it was going to be. So as soon as the music started, I would find, quickly cover his eyes and cover his ears and I would just kind of sh want to shield him from what he was watching because I didn't want his little heart and his innocent little mind to be taught or to learn from what he was seeing on that screen. Um, fast forward maybe about six months later, um, we were watching TV together, watching a basketball game and a, and a commercial came on. I'm telling you, he was so used to me covering his eyes, he could recognize the music when it came on. The music came on, and he sprinted over to me and covered my eyes. He said, no, no, Daddy, don't watch. Right? It was hilarious. Um, but it got me thinking. I was so worried about his little eyes and his little heart. But, man, who was looking out for my eyes and my heart? Because I'll tell you what, I'm being discipled. Everywhere I go, I'm learning something. No exchange that we have is neutral. 
We're always going one way or the other. Now, I'm not going to be that pastor, right, who tells you burn all your non-worship CDs, cancel your Netflix account, stick your head in the sand and just hope Jesus comes back soon. Okay, that's not what I'm saying, all right? It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we have to at least honestly admit that everything is teaching us something. We're always being discipled, friends. We're always being discipled. We're always going in some direction, right? So it, it, behooves us, it begs us to ask the question, we have to ask the question, okay, what is discipleship, right? If we're not filling in the gaps with what we think it is, we're not, we kind of want to get away from the discipleship of the world, what is it? What does it look like to be a student of Christ? Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that we are disciples of Christ. So what does it look like? How do we do it well? Well, thankfully, Jesus was actually asked this very question. Because as disciples of Christ, what's important to him becomes what's important to us. So if you have your Bibles with you, open to Matthew chapter 22. It will be on the screen here behind me as well. Then in Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees, the religious teachers of the day, they kind of gathered around Jesus. And what was going on here is Jesus was showed up on the scene, man, and people were like coming to him. All of a sudden, people were getting set free and healed. All these, kind of these, what they call the sinners of the day, the prostitutes, the, the tax collectors, the people that wouldn't set foot in a church were coming to Jesus. And all of a sudden, these Pharisees were taking notice. They like, who is this guy? He, he claims to be God. He forgives sins. He brings healing. He claims to be God. What? So they were upset. They were frustrated with this guy, Jesus. So they were always looking for a way to trick him. So in Matthew 22, they've kind of gathered around him. And it says in verse 34, it says, the Pharisees met together to question him again. They were always, always questioning Jesus. Verse 35, one of them, an expert in religious law, so the guy who knew everything, tried to trap Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? It's a trap, right? Jesus knew it was a trap. It says they questioned him again. They were constantly trying to trap Jesus in his words. Remember, this was an expert in religious law, the guy who knew all the things. The entire law of the Old Testament, all the prophets, it's very likely he had all that memorized. He knew it all. And here he is challenging God, God incarnate, the Son of God on the earth. He says, well, what do you say is the most important thing? And we have to be careful here, friends, because as I read scriptures like this, I have a tendency to kind of read myself favorably into the text. Like I think I'd be the one, kind of like Jesus' assistant Messiah, like standing, get him, Jesus, you tell him. They're dumb. Yeah, get him, Jesus, right? I mean, I, I think I'd be that guy. But how often do I stand in the, or sit in the seat of a Pharisee in my life? Asking Jesus, well, what is the most important thing? And expecting an answer that matches up with my most important thing. The thing that I think is most important. The thing, again, whether it's Bible teaching or inner healing, the thing that I think God has gifted me in, the most important thing to me, and I want Jesus to confirm my pre-existing bias as to which is the most important commandment. And I am no different than the Pharisees of the day. I would love to think I'd be Jesus. I'm the assistant Messiah. I get it all. I mean, I am the assistant. No, I'm the chief of the Pharisees. I'm the one standing there accusing Jesus and asking him, and look how Jesus responds. Jesus replied, verse 37, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets hang on these two commands. Think about this for a minute. I mean, really, this, is, this should blow your mind. All the do's and don'ts of Scripture, all the words of the prophets as they spoke for God, all the commands, everything that this, the Bible shows us all hangs on these two things. Love the Lord your God and love the people he's put into your life. That is discipleship, friends. That is the big picture of what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ. And all those things, again, Bible reading and prayer and outreach and ministry, those things are great, but they aim to a greater purpose and that we will become a people, right, who is so caught up in the love of our creator that we are different than this world. We are different than the love of this world. So I've noticed a tendency in my life to define discipleship wrongly. And this is the big idea, right? We often define discipleship as primarily something we are doing instead of someone we are becoming. We often define discipleship as a program or a Bible study or something we are doing rather than a person 
that we are becoming. And I completely believe that doing things is important, and we'll get to that. But we have to start with becoming, because becoming precedes doing. And if we get these things out of whack, our doing will start to become obligation instead of opportunity. Our doing has to be preceded by becoming. It's not about obligation. Often we are way more focused on our spiritual resume, right, than we are on loving the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our minds. And I'm not coming from a position of saying, I have this right. I'm in process with this too. The good news is that we're all in this together. All right, so let's take the journey this morning. How do we do it? Like, how do we actually love God? Have you ever thought about that? Like, I'm supposed to love God. Most of the time I don't really feel like I love God. Like, it's, sometimes it's easy in worship when the music is playing. Like, it's, I'm singing and, yeah, I mean it. Maybe even sometimes in worship you're like, I don't, I don't know if I could even sing these words sometimes. Like, I don't, I don't know if I actually mean it. Or you walk out of this room and you go on with your week and there's all these things that happen all week long. And you're like, man, I just don't know what it looks like. How do I love God? Uh, what if after the service I approached you in the foyer and I said, hey, uh, during worship God was really speaking to me and, and he, he wants me to give you my truck. It's an F-350. Um, it's got all the great features. It's got air conditioning and DVD player. All you have to do is just think about it and the windows roll down. It's awesome, right? It's got all the newest technology. It's great. You'd be like, yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, can I have it? I'd be like, yeah, I don't have one. But I want to give it to you. You'd be like, dude, something is wrong with you, <laughs> right? Well, something is wrong with you. We cannot give away something that we don't have. We cannot give away something that we have not received for ourselves. And the Bible backs this up in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. It says, this is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. This is important. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us, for our sins. There's a supply chain to this thing called love. Where we have to have it in the right order. Our giving of love, even to God and to others, is always in light of receiving the love of God. It's always in light of receiving. Back it up to 1 John 4 verse 8, a few verses earlier says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You know in the news lately, I don't know if you've been reading the paper, but... Minnehaha Falls has been in the news lately because um, there's actually been a lot of people, if you've been to Minnehaha Falls, our family loves going there, it's, fun, it's a fun family day, you go and ride the tandem bikes and have some ice cream, then you walk down the stairs, you get to the bottom of the stairs and there's the falls right in front of you, it's a glorious sight, if you haven't been there, it's a great date day, um, it's a great place to get engaged, some of you gentlemen, you know what I'm saying, wink wink, um, it's, just, it's just an awesome place to be. So as you get down to the bottom of the stairs, there's a gate right in front of you, at the, the gate, the sign literally says, do not cross this gate. And like everybody just does it anyway, right? Like everybody hops the gate. There's always two kinds of people at Minnehaha Falls. The person standing behind the gate taking the pictures and the person hopping the gate and literally playing in the falls, right? Now those falls are, falls are pretty powerful, so you don't want to get underneath them. But people are walking around behind them and having fun in there. And I think devotions, daily devotions are like this, right? Have you, have you ever struggled with like, man, I just, my Bible reading, it, I, it seems like lame, I just seems, I just, I don't want to do it. it, it's hard, it's passionless, it's obligation. I think Bible reading is like that gate. I think daily devotions are like that gate. Because all day, every day, friends, in our lives, the world is going to throw up do not enter signs right in front of us. Right? It's busyness, it's our kids, it's our marriages, it's just kind of how we're feeling emotionally every single day. All day long, there's going to be Signs right in front of you says, do not enter. But friends, the moment that we open our Bibles, the moment that we press into prayer, we hop that fence and we run to the falls of God's love. Right? Here's the deal. I have nothing to do with the source of water, do I? The water is always there. Like I have nothing to do. I can't turn it on. I can't turn it off based on my performance that day, based on how good I hopped the fence. If I fell on my face or I stayed back, the water is still going. God is love. He is the source of love. There is no turning off or turning on for him. He is it, right? And so when I open my Bible, when I press into prayer, when I decide to go into a season of prayer and fasting, I am hopping that fence and I am running, put, positioning myself under the falls of God's ridiculous, awesome love, right? So devotions are not obligation. They're an opportunity to receive the love of God. That should free you up to read your Bible with more joy. It should free you up to fast with more happiness and peace in your life, knowing that every single time I open the word of God, every single time I go into prayer, every single time I, I plant my butt in the seats here at church, right, I am receiving 
the love of God. I'm a receiver. I'm primarily a recipient. My identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ is primarily as a recipient of God's love. It's kind of like sometimes, you know, when you're having people over to your house. Like we're at a season of life right now. We have four kids. Our house is a perennial disaster, right? It's like we have a little one-year-old who just destroys all the things. Like you turn your head for one second, every drawer in the kitchen is out on the floor. Uh, it's just crazy right now. But if somebody's coming over, what do you do? You do the mad dash, don't you? You're shoving things in closets. You're like, I don't even know we had that. I'm not sure where that goes. I'm going to put it in here. Like you're, you're, I mean, like, it'd be easier sometimes just to buy a new house. <laughs> Somebody's coming over. Let's buy a new house to start over. <laughs> It'll be way better that way, right? Way less stressful. Um, here's the deal. Jesus doesn't give you the courtesy of a call ahead of time. He doesn't. He just kicks down the door of your mess and says, here I am. I don't care about that. Think I didn't know about that already? You think I didn't know already about that thing that was holding you back? You think I didn't already know what you're walking through, the thoughts and intentions of your heart? You think I didn't already know, but here I am. Here I am. I'm with you. In a few moments as we take communion together as a church, that's what I want us to remember, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me back up. Right, so God invades our mess. That is the gospel. The simple gospel is God invading our life, our brokenness, our sin, our mess. Here he comes, right? So go back to our original question, our original kind of stated intent, right? Discipleship is more about becoming, about resting in the love of God, about receiving the love of God, about positioning ourselves under the overflow of the, of, the, um, of the wave of God's love, and then we go into doing. Because, friends, there is doing. How many of you know there is a doing attached to our faith? There is a walking out of our faith. There is a, a living out of what God has called us to do as people. That's why there was a second commandment. And the second is like it, Matthew twenty two thirty nine. 39, it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we have to understand the nature of the love prescribed here is a costly one. Everything we've been studying in the book of Matthew is actually originally written in the, in the Greek language. And the word, Greek word for the word love is actually the Greek word agape. Many of you probably heard this before. It's the Greek word agape. And what agape means is it's not a, a love based on feelings or emotions or romanticness or even warm feelings, the warm fuzzies towards somebody. Agape love cost something. Agape love is the kind of love that presses in regardless of circumstances, regardless of pain, regardless of pressure. It leans into the tension of human relationship and of sin and brokenness and difficulty and conflict and says, I choose to love anyway. This past Friday, my wife Erica and I, we celebrated 10 years of marriage, which was so much fun, so awesome. We made it. You should be praying for her. If you're going to clap, you should clap for her because she's put up with me for the last 10 years. It's been so fun. I'm telling you, there's been so many times in our marriage, you guys, where things were just clicking. Um, there's been plenty. Of, I'm, I'm a kind of a hopeless romantic, so I love doing things for her. I love the warm feelings we have. I love that she's just my friend. Like, we love doing stuff together. If you've ever been in our home, you might leave yourself wondering, do they even like each other? Because we love sarcasm in our home. It's kind of our love language. Um, is sarcasm and also Chipotle. There are two love languages, sarcasm and Chipotle. Uh, we just love doing life with each other, right? We love it. But, but I'm telling you, there have been so many times over the course of our marriage where life was just so hard. Our personalities, different. Our backgrounds and upbringing, different, right? Our, our thoughts on most things, different, right? We've had to lean into a lot of tension in our marriage. And I'm telling you, every single time that by the grace of God, I have chosen to lay down my own rights, right? my own desire to give my opinion, or my own desire to be right, or my own desire to have my way, every single time I have done that, our marriage has gotten so much stronger. And, and over 10 years, as we have learned to do that with each other, and we have a long ways to go. I pray we have another 50, 60 years learning to do that well. But man, every single time I've done that, our marriage has grown. Even this last Friday, it was our anniversary. I had a whole day planned for her. I'll be honest, our anniversary day was one of the hardest days we've had in quite some time. We had a lot of great stuff planned and extenuating circumstances beyond our control kind of crept into our life and kind of crowded out and to get to the point where we had, we had some of the stuff that I planned got done, but some of the really fun stuff didn't get to happen. And I was just, I'll be honest, I was frustrated, I was sad, I was angry, but I felt God speak to me and said, dude, you're about to preach on this this Sunday. <laughs> get it together, man. <laughs> right? And so by the grace of God, I, I swallowed my pride, swallowed my right and desire to be frustrated, to be sad, to be moody. And said, nope, we're going to lean into this together. We're in this together. That is agape love. The times of growth in your life will always be during a season where God is asking you to, to show agape love. 
love regardless of tension, regardless of conflict, regardless of your desire or emotions in doing it. So I'm telling you, we have a long ways to go in our marriage, but that is the idea. This is the love God has loved us with. He has moved past all of our preconceptions, all of our facades, all the masks that we wear and said, nope, I want the real thing. I want the real thing. So let's get really practical, right? So how do we do this? How do we receive the love of God, give that love back to God, and then as God works in us, how do we kind of test this out? Right? How do we kind of gauge how well, how good of discipleship are we participating in? How, how good are we doing at this? Uh, a really good question to kind of ask yourself is kind of what I call, it's kind of this personal discipleship test. Right? It's kind of a way to kind of measure. My kids right now, um, they're obsessed with measuring themselves. We have the ruler in our house, and every day they want to measure themselves. I'm like, dude, you only grew like an eighth of a millimeter last night when you were sleeping. Um, but we measure growth over time, over years, don't we? So how do we actually measure how well we are doing in this? Well, here's a question. And if you're a note taker, write this down. It'll be on the screen behind me. This is a question I want us all as a church to reflect on this week. The question is this, is how willing am I to put my love into action, especially when it costs me something? How willing am I to put my love into action, especially when it costs me something. Because again, agape love will cost you something. And I'm not just talking about money. Sometimes it will cost you financially, but often it will cost you in terms of your energy and your relationships and your time and, dare I say, your comfort. Agape love moves past all those things and into a willingness to sacrificially and servanthoodedly, servanthoodedly, is that even a word? Servanthoodedly serve in such a way that, man, God's love is activated in us. Because that's the same love that I have received in Christ. It's the very same love. I'm loving with a love that is not my own. So how do we gauge this? I think that a great way to ask this question in our lives is how do you deal with difficult people in your life? You know the person that just like really rubs you the wrong way? If they're sitting right next to you right now, do not look at them. Keep your eyes to the front, okay? If you're sweating a little bit, it's maybe because it's you. Um, but all of us have that person, you know who that person, that person in your life who just grinds your gears, who everything they say you're like, really dude? Um, they just, for whatever reason, they're just so difficult for you to be around. You know who it is, you have that person in your mind right now. My question for you is, man, how are you doing at loving that person? Because it's easy to love the people that love us in return. It's easy to love the people that give us something back. But what about the person that gives you nothing back and nothing in return? Three quick practical things that I want to give us today as a church to help us love difficult people. Number one is just ask them what their story is. Just invite them for coffee, buy them lunch, whatever you got to do. Get across the table from them and just ask them their story. Ask them, ask them probing questions about their pain, about their experience, about their family, about their work. And be careful because you might just start to get God's view for them. You just might start to understand God's heart as they are somebody created in the image of their creator. Right? They're difficult, yeah, but they're in the image of God. Right? So listen without the intent to reply. Listen to their story. Don't give advice. Don't share your story. Just ask questions. Imagine that. A whole conversation where you just shut up and listen. Right? That person is driving you crazy. You're going to want to talk. You're going to want to say something. Listen. Ask for God's heart for them. Number two, man, meet a need that they have. Everyone has a need. Maybe you actually have a really great need right now that you're waiting on God's provision for. A great way to wait for your own provision is to become somebody else's provision, especially somebody who's difficult for you. Right? Meet somebody else's needs. How can you leverage the strength and resource and giftedness God has given you for their good? It's going to take some work. It's not going to happen by accident. You actually have to have a conversation. You actually have to do some research. And here's the catch. You may get nothing in return. Are you prepared for that? Because that's agape love. Agape love gives and expects nothing in return. So we ask them what their story is. We listen. We meet a need that they have. And number three, man, ask God for help. We can't do this by ourselves. Agape love is not human love. It's the love that we get from God. And that's why even as we're going into communion time right now, I just want to preface that by saying um, I love doing communion together as a community because what I think, I think that communion and discipleship are linked together. Because if we're following Christ and if we're catching God's love for us and giving God's love for people away, we have to be in daily communion with the source of all love, which is God. 
So in communion, I love that what we're doing with communion is we're, we're saying it's basically an act of rebellion against the discipleship of the world. Like all of these things that want to teach us and disciple us, we get to rebel against those. And as we take communion, Jesus said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of what? Of me. And as we take communion, we're actually ingesting symbolically the body and bread of Jesus Christ. The body and blood of Jesus Christ as it comes in, which is a statement saying, man, Jesus, I think we have to have this preference that, or this idea that Jesus is kind of walking next to me through life. Like he's my co-pilot, he's my homeboy, like he's next to me, we're walking this life together. And it's so much better than that. It is. Because with communion, what we're saying is no, literally I am taking in on the inside of me the body and blood of Christ. And now Jesus is living his life, not next to me, but in me. So as a commune with Christ, it's his love that's working its way out of my life. So as we even gather together as a family, what we're doing is we're rebelling. We're saying no to the discipleship of the world and yes to the discipleship of Jesus Christ in our lives. As he lives his life in us and lives his life through us. Friends, he is with you. We're taking communion. What we're saying is God is not done with my marriage. God is not done with my job. God is not done with my ministry. God is not done with me. And I'm rebelling against the idea that he has done with me by literally communing with him symbolically, but also knowing that in doing so, I am stating that God is with me and he is for me. And he's going to love the people in my life, even the difficult people, through me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that right here, right now, you are with us. Thank you that our primary identity is not in achieving, but in receiving. God, you have given us your Holy Spirit. And now as we move into a time of communion, we just ask that you would move us to a place of recognizing your great love for us in that you made us new. We are new creations. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you this morning, if man, you just want to respond to that love. Maybe you never responded to it. Maybe you thought you had responded to it, but you're saying, man, this kind of love, this love that comes into my mess and comes into my sin, comes into my brokenness, this is new to me. I would love to give you a chance just to respond to that. So I'm not going to make you come up here again, every head bowed, every eye closed. You just want to pull out your phone real quick and just text the word substance to 31996. No one looking, no one watching. If that's you, I just want to respond to this love of God, the love that comes into my life and saves me and rescues me and transforms me and disciples me. We would love, our team would love to follow up with you and get you started on the path of discipleship of learning what it means to be loved by Christ. Again, text the word substance to 31996. But Father, thank you that right now you are in this room. We don't have to invite you in that. We are literally carriers of your presence to a lost, hurting, broken world. So I pray that you would use us in such a way that people would know your love, respond to it, and be changed forever. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said, amen.